From Microbe TV, this is Infectious Disease Pustcast, Episode 9, recorded on August 17th, 2022. I'm Daniel Griffin, and joining me today is Sarah Dong. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Pustcast. References, as always, are available in our show notes at microbe.tv, the home of our multimedia empire. Pustcast is a review of the infectious disease literature from the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. Now on to the literature, shall we? All right, we will start with our viral. And remember to listen to the TWIV clinical update for covid polio, and monkeypox-related information. Uh, let me start with the correspondence, a zoonotic henna pa- uh, I'm going to, of course, have lots of pronunciation problems going forward, but so uh, everyone enjoy, feel free to email in, a zoonotic <laughs> henna pa- virus in febrile patients in China was published in New England Journal of Medicine. The Hendra virus and the Nipah virus, which belong to the genus henna Pavirus in the family Paramyxoviridae are known to infect humans and cause fatal disease. However, other related Heta Henipa viruses have been detected in bats, rodents, and shrews. Yes, as I mentioned to Vincent, the little animals, not the people. During sentinel <laughs> surveillance of febrile patients with a recent history of animal exposure in eastern China, a phylogenetically distinct Hennipa virus named Alangia Hennipa virus was identified in a throat swab isolate from one patient by means of metagenomic analysis and subsequent virus isolation. Subsequent isolation identified 35 patients with acute infection in the Shandong and Henan provinces of China, among whom 26 were infected um, with the Alangia Hennipa virus, only no other pathogens were present. These 26 patients presented with fever, that was 100% of patients, fatigue, 54%, cough, 50%, anorexia, 50%, myalgia, 46%, nausea, 38%, headache, 35%, vomiting, 35%, accompanied by abnormalities of thrombocytopenia, so low platelets in 35%, leukopenia in 54%, impaired liver and kidney function, 35 and 8% respectively. A zero survey of domestic animals detected seropositivity in goats, 2%, dogs, 5%. Among 25 species of wild small animals, the RNA of this virus was predominantly detected in shrews, 27%, a finding that suggests that the shrew may be a natural reservoir of this virus. Now I'm going to... Uh, read their, their conclusion. Although the current study does not fulfill Cox postulates, the following findings from the patients with acute Langya Hennipa virus <laughs> um, suggest that this virus was the cause of febrile illness. Now, what are Koch's postulates for our listeners? There are four. The microorganisms must be found in abundance in all organisms suffering from the disease, uh, but should not be found in healthy organisms. Two, the microorganism must be isolated from a diseased organism and grown in pure culture. Three, the cultured microorganism should cause disease when introduced into a healthy organism. And four, the microorganism must be re-isolated from the inoculated diseased experimental host and identified as being identical to the original specific causative agent. So quite a high bar, but I would say this publication is rather compelling. Yeah. Um, well, our other viral paper today is from OFID, current role of prospective monitoring preemptive and prophylactic therapy for human herpes virus 6 or HHV6 after allogeneic stem cell transplant. And I, I have only a quick <laughs> statement is that I thought this was a really great summary of a topic that is very frequently misunderstood. And I feel like... Um, HHV6 reactivation is challenging because we we worry about these complications like delayed platelet engraftment and GVHD and encephalitis, but 
Um, often it may not fit in the clinical context of why we're called, um, but this is a really nice paper that talks about the issues as well as the available studies. So you can answer all those questions about reactivation rates and prospective monitoring and sort of what are those thresholds where we think about risk of, of really true HHV6 disease. Um, with the key being that our current evidence suggests that disease can occur even in the absence of high-level plasma reactivation. And there's also a really nice table that summarizes the three published guidelines that uh, recommend against prospective testing for HHV6 DNA after an allotransplant, or at least for only a short period in certain high-risk patients. Um, so if folks are seeing these patients, I think this is a really great resource. All right, I will move us over to the bacterial section. For other um, similar topics, you can check check out this week in microbiology. Uh, the first one is this really interesting uh, outbreak. So in Lancet ID, nationwide tuberculosis outbreak in the USA linked to bone graft product and outbreak report. And so there was an 80-year-old tissue donor who had unrecognized risk factors and signs and symptoms of TB had bone procured from um, this patient, the deceased donor, that ultimately was processed into over 150 units of bone allograft product containing live cells. And those units all went out to 37 hospitals and ambulatory centers in 20 U.S. states, and this was in 2021. And so 88% of these samples were implanted into 113 recipients in 18 states. Um, and then once they knew about this outbreak, the remaining samples were sequestered. 77% of the 113 product recipients had microbiological or imaging evidence of TB disease, mostly spinal and disseminated TB. Um, and actually, eight recipients died within 100 days after their implantation, and three deaths attributed to TB after recognition of the outbreak. So it's a, this was just such an incredible case, you know, donor-derived transmission of MTB through bone allograft uh, with very substantial morbidity and mortality. Um, and they sort of talk a little bit about how there probably was a pretty significant high mycobacterial load that, of course, is getting inoculated directly into skeletal sites. And then sort of post-op, you probably have a lot of vascular permeability that uh, sort of helps with disseminating the infection. Um, and there was even a note about maybe sort of the way these products are made themselves can facilitate that mycobacterial growth. Uh, so the next question is, what can we do to avoid this in the future? And, you know, the you have to think about how do we approach direct testing of donated tissues? Um, for these types of products, I think they're often stored for a while. So they're uh, after this came out, the American Association of Tissue Banks issued a new recommendation that PCR testing could be considered for tissues obtained from donors with TB risk factors or minimally processed tissues at highest risk for transmitting MTB. So fresh grafts, live cells, stem cells, any tissue with viable cells. But all of that stems back to us being able to know that that patient was high risk for TB, which um, in this scenario we didn't know, or at least it wasn't um, clear at the time that the samples were obtained. So just a really fascinating outbreak, but also amazing that they identified all these patients after the index um, TB cluster report. So I put this in because viruses are getting all of the attention, but let us not forget about our old, uh, very persistent friend, TB. All right. Well, tuberculosis is always one of my favorites, so will not be forgotten in my heart. <laughs> um, but let us go into uh, a, an article, and actually uh, maybe uh, Sarah will want to jump in a little bit, a little bit of a deeper dive here, because there is a febrile episode cleverly uh, titled Bad to the Bone, one of my favorite George <laughs> Thorogood songs, not appropriate for children. <laughs> Now, the article, Meta-Analysis, Outcomes of Surgical and Medical Management of Diabetic Foot Osteomyelitis, was published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. Here, the authors performed a PubMed and Google Scholar search of articles related to diabetic foot osteomyelitis. Um, dates January, they say 1931 to January 2020. Is that a typo? That seems like a really long period of time. No, I, I, I remember thinking that's really <laughs> early. <laughs> 
<laughs> Articles that involved Charcot, Charco arthropathy, case reports, small case series, review articles, commentaries, non-human studies, and non-English articles were excluded. Quadus 2 was used to rate the bias of each study. A meta-analysis was performed using random effects at inverse variance methods. All right. The search yielded 1,192 articles. I'm beginning to think this was like a fellow and this was like their last year research gig. But after reviewing and removal of articles that did not meet inclusion criteria, 28 articles remain standing. 18 articles related to the medical management of DFO, diabetic foot osteomyelitis, I guess a new... Uh, a new three-letter acronym for me, and 13 articles related to surgical management. Three articles looked at a combination of medical and surgical management and were included in both groups, trying to figure out if the pile was high enough to turn all of this into gold. Based on these studies, they reported that the average success rate for medical treatment was a lowly 68%, and for surgical and medical treatment was 86%. There were significant inconsistencies in accounting for peripheral arterial disease, peripheral neuropathy. Uh, there was significant heterogeneity in outcomes between the studies. However, there was a high rate of successful treatment and a wide range between patients with medical treatment and combined surgical and medical treatment. So in summary, it seems that a combination of medical treatment and surgery, so combined surgery and medical treatment, looked a lot better than just trying to cure it with many, many weeks of IV antibiotics. Did you have any comments on that, Sarah? <laughs> Well, I feel like as I was reading this, I was thinking about how hard it is to ask questions about diabetic foot infection. I mean, you mentioned that there's a lot of heterogeneity, but uh, even separate from the question of like medical versus medical and surgical therapy, all of it relies on sort of how we define and compare how these patients did. And I feel like that's really hard and we don't have a great way to do that between studies. Um, the other thing I thought about is they, you know, sort of excluded patients who had uh, P uh, peripheral artery disease. And I, I feel like a lot of the conversation when you have those medical uh, and surgical conversation um, conversations with the podiatrist and the vascular teams, it all revolves around their perfusion and, and how you think they're going to do. And so that's like a, I feel like something that comes up a lot in the hospital and Anyways, it's sort of a separate separate point, but I think uh, interesting. But a lot of the questions about like what what antibiotics we should use and and how they do is is still hard to answer because it's just hard to look at outcomes for this. Yeah, I think that this is still this is I think as I sometimes talk about in our training, this maybe was not what attracted people to infectious disease, but this is our <laughs> bread and butter, so to speak. We do a lot of yeah. this, um, and I think it's a little surprising to see um, that we don't have quite the level of guidance that we would like. There's quite a heterogeneity not only in these studies but also in the approach to this in the clinical world. Mm -hmm. All right. And so I actually have a follow-up next for some, probably the pediatricians or, or pediatric ID docs who might have seen some listserv messages about this. But in MMWR from earlier in August, notes from the field, increase in pediatric intracranial infections during the COVID-19 pandemic, eight pediatric hospitals, U.S., March 2020 to March 2022. And so there were a, a couple messages through the listservs and sort of anecdotal reports of increased rates of intracranial bacterial infections um, sort of during or right after COVID infection. And people were trying to get a sense of if this was happening everywhere or just to them. So these are results from an EIN survey or emergency infections network. Um, had 109 respondents. 43% reported an increase in intracranial infections. And so they did a follow-up survey among uh, 64 respondents who expressed interest, and then eight queried their EMR about this question. Um, and so 
their results I'm going to read through here. Isolated intracranial abscess increased in participating institutions by a mean of 100%. Sinusitis complicated by intracranial abscess increased by a mean of 77%. Orbital cellulitis, sinusitis, mastoiditis decreased on average by 15%, 32%, and 25% respectively. And then mastoiditis complicated by intracranial abscess decreased by 117%. Uh, So, I mean, a relatively small look at this question, but the CDC is requesting reports for uh, brain abscess, epidural empyema, or subdural empyema in children who have not had a history of neurosurgery or trauma. Um, I have another short one. In this week's edition of Vaccines Are Awesome and JAMA Network Open, incidents of acute chest syndrome in children with sickle cell disease following implementation of the 13-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine in France. So this was a cohort study from a French surveillance system of over 100,000 hospitalizations, investigated whether implementation of PCV13 in the general pediatric population was associated with the change in the incidence of acute chest syndrome in children with sickle cell disease. Um, And so they used an interrupted time series analysis of this prospective cohort and found a significant decrease in the incidence of acute chest after PCV13 implementation in 2010. Uh, I put this in here because it made me think of a related topic, and I actually I think I saw this uh, during a talk from Paul Offit. But there's these really awesome or interesting graphs of how after childhood PCV13 came out, you saw these indirect effects on invasive pneumococcal disease in adults, meaning uh, pneumococcal disease in U.S. adults declined after we were giving the vaccine in children, regardless of the direct use in adults. So those were very impactful graphs for me, particularly as like a budding ID slash med peds person. So I thought I would throw that out there. All right. And our last bacterial paper from Nature Microbiology. I'm trying to get out of my comfort zone and talk about topics that I feel, uh, less confident in, uh, antibiotic resistance genes in the gut microbiota of mothers and linked neonates with or without sepsis from low and middle income countries. Uh, so this examined rectal microbiota of about 3000 neonates with clinical signs of sepsis and about 15,000 mothers who were screened for resistance genes like NDM, KPC, OXA48. Um, and they found that E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae and Enterobacter were the most commonly found isolates. And then they did whole genome sequencing and found close relationships between the isolates of the samples. So suggesting transmission of bacteria between neonates and moms. Um, And it really highlighted the high carriage rates of these important beta-lactamase genes in moms and neonates who had confirmed sepsis and were in low and middle income countries. Um, And in this setting, the presence of those genes was a predictor of neonatal sepsis and adverse birth outcomes. So a really cool study that I still have to wrap my head around some of the more details, uh, detailed parts of the paper, but uh, really cool. All right. And moving on to fungal. And we definitely need a This Week in Fun Guy. Uh, <laughs> so people are out there listening. Uh, you know, someone someone should uh, reach out, let us know. Someone very excited to talk about fungus every week. But the article, Clinical Characteristics, Healthcare Utilization and Outcomes Among Patients in a Pilot Surveillance System for Invasive Mold Disease, Georgia, United States, 2017 through 2019. This was the editor's choice in open form infectious disease. During 2017 through 2019, the Emerging Infections Program conducted active IMD surveillance at three Atlanta area hospitals. That's Invasive Mold Disease, IMD, another three-letter acronym. The most common IMD types were invasive aspergillosis, mucormycosis, and fusariosis. The most frequently affected body sites were pulmonary, otorhinolaryngologic, cutaneous deep tissue, 
45 or 43.3% of the IMD patients received ICU level care and 90 day all cause mortality was 32.7%. So a really high mortality um, issue when an individual has invasive mold disease. So um, let's keep those fungal investigations coming. All right, parasitic, be sure to listen to This Week in Parasitism. Uh, We just recorded one uh, hot off the press, so to speak. Um, But let us talk about the paper, low-dose subcutaneous or intravenous monoclonal antibody to prevent malaria. So monoclonal therapies to prevent malaria, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, So these are the results of a phase one clinical trial to assess the safety and pharmacokinetics of L9LS, a next-generation anti-malarial monoclonal antibody and its protective efficacy against controlled human malaria infection in healthy adults who had never had malaria or received a vaccine for malaria. The participants received L9LS, they need a new name for that, either intravenously or subcutaneously at a dose of one milligram, five milligrams, or 20 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. A total of 17 of the recipients and six control participants underwent controlled human malaria infection. Pretty cool. Of the 17 participants who received a single dose of L9LS, 88% were protected after controlled human malaria infection. Parasitemia did not develop in any of the participants who received 5 or 20 milligrams per kilogram of intravenous L9LS. Parasitemia developed in one of five participants who received 1 milligram per kilogram, um, one of five participants who received 5 milligrams per kilogram, and all control participants through 21 days after the controlled human malaria infection. I am impressed that this works, to be honest. Um, Despite a PhD in B-cell biology, this seems like we are asking a lot. Um, These antibodies need to prevent plasmodium falciparum malaria at the pre-erythrocytic stage that precedes clinical blood stage infection by neutralizing the infecting sporozoites. This antibody works by binding to the major P falciparum circumsporozoite protein. Looking forward to more to follow, but remember, this is minutes. You have minutes to neutralize all these sporozoites before they end up in the liver. So quite a lift, pretty impressive. (laughs) All right. In CID, I have another editor's choice manuscript Revisiting the evidence base for modern day practice of treatment of toxoplasmic encephalitis, a systematic review and meta analysis. And to cut to the punchline, uh, trimethoprim sulfa seemed to be effective and safer and less headaches than using pyrimethamine containing regimens for toxoencephalitis. Um, so, similar efficacy for clinical response radiologic response, mortality, and people uh, stopped taking their medications less. Uh, I think this is not a terrible surprise to many people. I think that um, despite our guidelines saying to use the combination of the um, pure methamine regimens that Bactrim is, sorry, trimethoprim sulfa is frequently used um, in these settings and, and patients seem to have done well. Um, And that doesn't even address the fact of how hard it is to get some of the other medications that are recommended for toxoplasma. So I thought this was, this was great. They looked at uh, six RCTs or dose escalation study, and then a 26 single arm or observational studies. What do you think, Daniel? All right. Well, I was a little, little jealous that Sarah chose this one. I wondered if that endless (laughs) headache was, was a pun. Um, it was, <laughs> but uh, I have to say, actually, the, the TMP sulfa is something we've been using overseas for a number of years. So it's nice to really have uh, a little more science supporting it. Um, so, all right, Chagas disease. I think someone predicted a number of years ago that this would be the new HIV AIDS of the Americas. I wonder if he's listening. The article: a phase two randomized multicenter placebo controlled proof of concept trial of oral. Fexanidazole in adults with chronic indeterminate Chagas disease was published in CID. So these are the results of a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled, dose-finding, proof-of-concept study conducted in Bolivia. 
I think that's where Shay was killed. Adults with serologically confirmed chronic indeterminate uh, Chagas disease and positive PCR were randomly assigned to one of six regiments um, or placebo. Target recruitment was 20 patients per arm. The primary endpoint was sustained parasitological clearance by serial negative qPCR from end of treatment until six months follow-up in the intention to treat population. Follow-up was actually extended to 12 months. Um, a bit of background I suspect is needed here. Um, Chagas disease for our listeners is a parasitic disease acquired from the Reduvid bug with an estimated five 0.7 million people infected, 70 million at risk of infection, greater than 10,000 deaths per year. It might be from contact with the feces of this bug in your eye or an open bite, or now more and more cases are from contaminated juices sweetened with sugarcane. When they're mashing up that sugarcane, there might be a few bugs that get smashed and then you drink it on down. Currently, only two medications, benzonidazole and nifertamox, um, and we're not even sure how effective they really are, but what we are sure about is they are hard to access and even harder to tolerate. Fexanidazole is a drug um, for sleeping sickness, another trypanosome disease, and the hope is that it might offer another option, one that is effective tolerated and maybe easier to access. In this study, enrollment was interrupted after four of the 47 patients developed transient asymptomatic neutropenia. Treatment of ongoing patients was stopped in all patients administered for greater than two weeks. A total of 40 patients received from three days to eight weeks of treatment with fexinidazole, delayed onset of neutropenia, N equals eight, and increased liver enzymes, N equals eight, were found in the fexinidazole treated patients versus none in the placebo arm. In the intent to treat analysis, sustained parasitological clearance um, to out to 12 months follow-up varied between 66.7 in the 12 milligram two week to 100% in the 1800 milligram two week. Rapid sustained clearance of parasitemia was observed in all treated patients with available data, but not in all patients in the placebo group. So the authors suggest that further exploratory exposure remonts analysis suggested low doses of fexnidazole might be safe and effective, but some of these doses were definitely not safe. All right, I'm going to close this out with a couple miscellaneous ones. The first one in Nature Climate Change was entitled Over Half of Known Human Pathogenic Diseases Can Be Aggravated by Climate Change. And uh, really, the title says it all, but uh, the paper does talk uh, a bit about the extent of risk of climate change and infectious diseases and, and some specific examples. So climate-related events or, or trends or their impact on geophysical systems like floods, droughts, and sea level rise. Um, and they found that 58% or 218 of the 375 infectious diseases that they looked at have been aggravated by climate hazards, while 16% were at times diminished. And so just something to, to check out. I think we in ID talk about this a lot, um, but it was interesting to see more of a overview approach and how they look at uh, how these are linked to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, all right. Uh, this next topic I love very much, and it actually is the first February episode. Uh, in OFID, the impact of standardized infectious diseases consultation on post-splenectomy care and outcomes. And of course, we have to talk about when there's a paper about ID consults. This was a single center quasi-experimental study comparing care for the asplenic patient outcomes between a prospective cohort of 50 patients who received the intervention of a standardized ID provider checking them out and, and making sure they got all the things that they needed versus a historic control cohort that had 128 patients. So patients who had a splenectomy at the same institution but not but did not have this ID intervention. As they found that vaccination rates, patient education, and on-demand antibiotic use improved, sorry, the fact that they received it, not that they had to use it, um, all improved <laughs> significantly when you had an ID cons uh, consult. So non-significant trend towards a mortality benefit, um, but a statistically significant decrease in the rate of overwhelming infection in the intervention group, um, but not specifically in uh, death. 
But I love this topic. It's an awesome thing that we can really be advocates for um, because I think often these vaccinations and education pieces get overlooked, particularly if uh, they have their spleen taken out in a more emergent setting. And I will finish this up from another paper from OFID, hashtag curbsiding, potential value and patient confidentiality implications of ID clinician peer consultations via social media. So have you ever looked for advice on a tough ID consult on Twitter? Many of you would say yes. Uh, so these uh, authors took a look at ID peer consults in a six-week period on Twitter and basically tried to look at and see if people got meaningful replies to their questions um, and identified some potential for confidentiality issues, which I think many of us would recognize. I'm sure you've seen things that uh, you know are right on the border. Even if something doesn't fall into those 18 identifiers for HIPAA, you can still unintentionally uh, reveal things about your patients. So I was going to end by saying uh, drink I mean, tweet responsibly. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. As always, the references for this show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our multimedia empire. You can find the Infectious Disease podcast at Apple Podcasts and at microbe.tv forward slash podcast and on YouTube. We love to get your questions, comments, and paper suggestions, so keep sending them to puscast at microbe.tv. And because it'll make you feel so good, consider supporting the science shows at Microbe TV at microbe.tv forward slash contribute. I'm Sarah Dong. You can find me on Twitter at swindong, at Febrile Podcast, or at febrilepodcast.com. And I'm Daniel Griffin, and you can find me at ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, on Twitter, at Daniel Griffin MD, as well as on the other podcasts, This Week in Parasitism and This Week in Virology Clinical Updates. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another podcast is infectious.